Welcome to church on this Labor Day weekend. I'm excited that you're here. For those of you who are joining us right now at our West Campus or at the Church at Shepherd or on Facebook Live or on our webcast or, hey, right here in this room, we're so glad that you are joining us this morning. Glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to talk about really an important passage of scripture. We're going to deal with Colossians chapter 1 and we're going to begin reading at verse 13 and read through verse 21 in just a few minutes. So if you want to get your Bible ready, uh, this particular message is, uh, is just really cool for me when I'm standing down there, I'm worshiping and I'm realizing that we are singing what I'm going to preach about today. So that's, for me, that's really a great confirmation um, that, that God is at work here, that God is saying something to his people, God is saying something to his church. So I'm really fired up about getting uh, to preach this particular message. I also believe that this message is not just important, but it's urgent. And let me explain why. This week, LifeWay Research um, released the results of some extensive work that they had done on the beliefs of people in America, of Christians in America, about who Jesus is. And they, they did this entire survey, major news outlets, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, all picked up on this. And talked about it. The headlines were a little bit misleading sometimes, but they found some interesting things. For example, among all people, um, both Christian and non Christian, about 52%, over half, believe that Jesus was just a good teacher. 52% believe Jesus was just a good teacher. Now, while obviously I would disagree with that, that's the beliefs of all kinds of people from all kinds of faith. So I don't find that alarming. But what I did find alarming was kind of the headline of this whole survey. And that is when asked the questions that self-identified people as evangelical Christians. They said they believe the Bible is the authority for their lives. They believe people needed to uh, receive Jesus to be their savior, to go to heaven when they died. Of those people, only 66%, two-thirds, said they believe Jesus is God. The headline out of that was, one-third of evangelical Christians do not believe Jesus is God. And I just, I wanted to say, oh, let me fix that headline for you. One third of evangelical Christians aren't even Christian. That's what that means. There are some things you have to believe to be a Christian. Okay? It is Christianity. It's all about Christ. Okay? We can disagree about gifts of the Spirit and like how much of salvation is God's sovereignty and man's will or volition. We can kind of talk about that and have discussions about that. We can have discussions uh, about creation. Was it six literal days, which is what I, what I believe? Is it longer periods of time? Some people believe that. We can have great discussions about those kind of second-tier issues. But who Jesus is is really kind of at the top of this deal. It's really the most important thing about our faith is who is Jesus? What do we believe about Jesus? So as church members, some of you who are here, you've professed faith in Christ. Maybe today you need to kind of dig in with me. We're going to get out our shovels and do a little digging this morning in scripture and, uh, and kind of solidify this in your life. For those of you who would say, you know what, I'm, I'm not really a Christian. Maybe you're watching this on, on uh, some kind of social, one of our social media feeds, and you're like, I kind of, I'm watching this, but I don't know if I believe this stuff. You really ought to know what we believe. And if you'll just give me the next few minutes and let me express to you what biblical Christians believe about Jesus, I think you'll find it compelling. We talked about this letter uh, to the church at Colossae, and we've introduced it and walked through it, and we get now to the, to the first really meaty section of, of this letter. Paul knew that while this church was flourishing and while good things were happening in this church, people were coming to faith in Christ, they're growing in their faith, they're, they're being discipled, and being a disciple means that you go out and you make more disciples, they're reaching people, they're reaching their friends for Jesus. But Paul knew that in churches all over the Roman Empire that he had planted, false beliefs were popping up. 
There were these false uh, beliefs. There were these false doctrines that were infiltrating churches. And so Paul wants to arm the church at Colossae. This is a preemptive strike to say, I want you to be really solid on what you believe. And the first one of these false beliefs he tackles is about Jesus. He says, I want you to know the truth about Jesus. So let me back up just a couple of verses into what we talked about last week. And I'm going to read through this because it's really all one big unit of thought. Verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let me give you four absolute truths about Jesus. Four things that you can hang on to, four things that are absolutely, eternally true. Here's the first one. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Savior. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week, but it's worth sort of plowing back into. And let me just mention a few of these things that Paul said. In verse 12, he said, he qualified us. In other words, none of us measure up to God's righteous standard. The book of Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't measure up to God's righteous standard. When I was a kid, I, I fell in love with roller coasters, and I've tried to convey that to my daughter that uh, her, uh, for her to love roller coasters with me, and I'm, I'm winning for the most part. There are a few of them she's still a little frightened of, but you remember when you were little, you'd go to an amusement park and you wanted to ride the roller coaster, and I went to this place called Opryland in Nashville, Tennessee. It doesn't even exist anymore. They tore, the, they tore down my childhood dreams, and uh, they built a shopping mall, by the way, and um, You'd go up to the to the roller coaster, and they'd always have this like this cartoon character. If you went to Six Flags, it's like Bugs Bunny, and he'd say, "You must be this tall to ride this ride, right?" So I can remember as a little boy, I wanted to ride this roller coaster really bad, and I went over and I got underneath that little thing, and I I stretched out as much as I could, and and I stretched my head up real, my neck up real far, and I even stood a little bit on my tiptoes, not enough that the person could see that I was doing it, and I still didn't quite hit that mark. I did not measure up. For the best of our trying, morally, before a perfect God, none of us measure up. But here's the good news. He qualified us. When we didn't qualify, he qualified us. And the Bible says he rescued us. He transferred us to his kingdom and he redeemed us. All of our salvation is dependent upon what Jesus did. Now, here's what I wanted to revisit, okay? Jesus is the one who has done all of that. He is the Savior. But what I want you to understand is this. He is the only Savior. He is the one and only. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And then he said this, no one comes to the Father but through me. I mean, those are the words of Jesus. There is no other way of salvation. Jesus is Savior. He's the one and only Savior. A few years ago, 
our dryer, our clothing dryer, uh, burned up, went out, whatever, and uh, tried to get it fixed. And our repairman said, the best thing you could do is just buy a new dryer. So we go down to the Lowe's store and we bought a new dryer. My wife had done some research. She had done some reading and she discovered, or what she's told me anyway, was that we needed to buy a gas dryer because they're more efficient. They use less uh, gas than the electric uses electricity. They dry things quicker, all those sort of things. She's convincing me about a gas dryer. So we go in, we buy the gas dryer. And the guy says to us, now look, we'll deliver it and we'll put it where you want it put, but we will not hook it up. And I'm like, why won't you hook it up? And he said, because you have to have a licensed plumber to hook up a gas dryer. He said, or you could try to do it yourself, but I don't recommend that. And I thought, well, why do I need to call a plumber? And my wife looked at me and said, you're calling the plumber, okay? She knows my mechanical acumen. If I walk through the house with a hammer in my hand, she's like, gets scared, okay? I mean, that's just, I'm not handy, okay? But I said, why do I have to have a plumber to do this? And this is what that guy said to me, and I will never forget it. Now, remember, we're dealing with natural gas. He said, sir, there are a lot of ways to get this wrong, but there's only one way to get this right. You don't want to get this wrong. You don't want to get a gas dryer wrong. You could blow up your house, right? You don't want to get salvation wrong because you could spend an eternity separated from God. And regardless of what the world tells you and what our intolerant culture of tolerance tells you, that there are multiple ways of God, that there's this prophet that says do this, that there's this religion that says this, there's this cult that says do this, there is one Savior and his name is Jesus. Period. Jesus is Savior. Number two, Jesus is God the Son. Now, our favorite way to refer to Jesus is that he's God's son. And that is true because we are Trinitarian. We believe there is one God who reveals himself eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit, all three co-equally God for all eternity, eternity past to eternity future. That is Orthodox Christianity. That has been settled centuries and centuries ago, and it is settled in Scripture. Jesus is not only the Son of God. He is God the Son. Here's the way Paul puts it in the passage that we read. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. In other words, he is the visible representation of the invisible God. He is the only God that you will ever see. In John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. A lot of people were looking for the Father. They're, they're saying that, well, the Father's God, so we want to we see the Father. Show us the Father, Jesus. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is saying, he is claiming for himself that he is God. This is scattered all throughout the Bible. Now, I want to show you a couple of the passages of Scripture that are really important, and I want you to follow along with me. If you follow along in your Bible, if you don't, the verses will be on the screen. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, here's what the Bible says about Jesus. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. And here's the expression. And the exact representation of his being. He is the exact representation. He is the absolute perfection of God revealed to us. That's who Jesus is. He is as much God as the Father is God. He is as much God as the Spirit is God. They are co-equally God forever. Paul also wrote about this in the book of Philippians. Paul wrote Uh, Paul wrote much of the New Testament. He wrote the book of Colossians that we're studying. He wrote the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians, he was admonishing the Christians at Philippi to be humble. And he used Jesus as an example of his humility. But not so much the life of Jesus that he used. He actually talked about how Jesus left 
the throne of God and came to be a man on earth. Here's what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. Who although he existed in the very form of God. Now pause right there for just a moment. He existed in the form of God. Before baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God the Son existed for all eternity before that moment. Who though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard his equality with God, co-equal with the Father and Spirit, He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or something he had to hang on to. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus was was and is God. He has always been God. Jesus came to be a man. But he did not give up being God to be a man. Now, he emptied himself. What does that mean? Well, God is everywhere, right? He's omnipresent. Well, Jesus emptied himself of his omnipresence. He confined himself to a human body. But that did not diminish the fact that he is God in human flesh. I was doing some research for this message, and I was really trying to find illustrations for the message. And I came across a video, and I think Ray Comfort, he's an evangelist, did this video. And he goes out on the streets, and he asks people questions. And he's just trying to find their attitudes about spiritual things and about um, about Jesus and those sort of things. And so he's talking to this one girl and he asked her if she was a Christian and she said yes. And so he's not going to settle for that. He's going to dig a little deeper and kind of dig in on that and see, you know, what do you base that on? And she gave the right answer. She said, because I've asked Jesus to be my savior. I'm a sinner. I've asked him to take away my sins. And so he, he goes a little deeper and he asks her another question. And then he asks another question. And he finally gets down to asking her, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God. And she goes, no, I don't think I, I believe that. So he stops and he's like, he's going to help her out. He corrects her. He shows her some of the verses I've shown you. Shows her, shows her some other verses. And uh, because we don't have time to do every single verse about this. And she said this, I don't think I've ever heard that. I've stopped, I, in my mind, I'm stopping for just a minute. I'm going, wait, wait, you're a Christian? You said you're a Christian. You gave the right answers. I know you've been to church at some point. Have you ever been to a Christmas Eve service? I mean, I don't know if you guys know this or not. I'm kind of giving up the trade secrets here. But we talk about the same thing every Christmas Eve. <laughs> God became man. Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, after his resurrection, after the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples saw him and they believed. Now, there was one particular disciple who was kind of AWOL. We call him Doubting Thomas, and I think his doubt just overwhelmed him because he's, he's not even in the picture. And they find Thomas and they say to him, Thomas, he's alive. We're telling you he's alive. And Thomas is like, I'm telling you, I'm going to stick my finger in his hand where they put the nails. And I'm going to put my hand in his side where they thrust that spear. Or I'm not going to believe any of this stuff you guys are telling me. So eight days later, they're all together. And finally, they kind of draw Thomas in. He comes back around and Jesus shows up. The Bible says the door was shut, but Jesus shows up in the room. I guess that's what you can do with a resurrection body. And he looks at Thomas and he says, Thomas, you said you wouldn't believe unless you saw it. So put your finger right there. See my side where they put the spear? And Thomas falls to his knees and he cries out. This is his expression. My Lord and my God. And Jesus did not correct him Because he was right. Now why is this important? This morning Daniel and our worship team led us in really wonderful Christ-centered worship. Only God deserves your worship. Only God. And since Jesus is God, 
He deserves your worship. He deserves for us to bring the passion of our hearts to our times of worship. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is God the Son. And Jesus is supreme. Jesus is supreme. Now, there's one little word in this that kind of trips people up. I want to explain it because I think it is really, really super important. In verse 15, the apostle Paul writes, for he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. When you see that, some people get tripped up. They go, oh, Jesus came into being when he was born. He's the firstborn. He, God the Father created him. That is false and wrong. That decision was made at a church council about 1,700 years ago. They kicked out the people who believed that and said, that's heresy is what it is. That reestablishes itself or reemerges every now and then in false teaching in our society, in our culture. Some people teach that in, in cults and in false religions. What does it mean when Paul called him the firstborn? Well, what he's talking about is that he is, he is the first among all of creation. That he is to have first place. As a matter of fact, that's what he says down in, in verse 18. That he himself will come to have first place in everything. And in the society that Paul was writing this, and in the Old Testament especially, the firstborn was the one who got all the privileges, all the perks. If you were a firstborn, you got a huge part of the inheritance, and all the other brothers got little bitty portions of the inheritance. If you were the firstborn and the father died, you, received, you were in authority over your family. It's interesting to me that when we talk about the Great Commission, we focus on the go, make disciples, teach people, baptize people. But the first thing Jesus said in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, is all authority has been given to me. Jesus claimed for himself that he was in charge. Jesus is large and in charge. He has all authority. He is supreme. And then the Bible tells us what he's supreme over. He's supreme over the created order. Verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in heavens and earth. Jesus was present and active in the creation. He was there. Father, Son, and Spirit formed the creation. In John chapter 1, John begins his gospel and I, I believe one of the most beautiful ways of any of the writing of the New Testament, it's almost like poetry. And John starts describing who Jesus is, and he uses a term for Jesus that is the Greek word logos. We translate it word because that's a faithful translation. So he calls Jesus the word. And here's the way he puts it in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. Before Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, there's a John 1-1 in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word, Jesus, was with God. And the Word was God. Let me just read that by inserting Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, or was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. John affirms the deity of Jesus Christ. But look at this. He was in the beginning. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is supreme over creation. No wonder when he was on, in a boat with his disciples out in this storm on the Sea of Galilee, he could stand up and say, peace be still, and the winds and the waves would obey him because he created the wind and he created the water. He created the waves. He, the, the creation obeys the creator. He is supreme over creation. He is supreme over Satan. Verse 16. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. When he talks about these thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, he's talking about spiritual beings, angelic beings. Satan is not 
co-eternal with God. There's not a good God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, an evil God, Satan. That's Greek mythology, not biblical Christianity. Satan is a created being. He is part of that angelic order and Satan rebelled against God. He was cast out of heaven and he took with him a third of the angels. They became demons and Jesus is supreme over them. It's not two equals fighting against one another. It is one who is a conquering hero and one who is a defeated foe. Satan has been defeated. Satan doesn't have any authority over you. The only authority Satan has is what you yield to him when you surrender to temptation and you believe his lies. Satan is a liar. And what he says to you are lies. When you believe his lies, then you give him authority in your life. But when you choose to, choose the, uh, when you choose to believe and proclaim the truth of the word of God, you speak the, the authority of Jesus over him. Some people say, well, Okay, if Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, which is what Jesus said he came to do, if Jesus has done that in, his, in the cross and the resurrection, why is the devil still around? Well, because we've got to play out the season. You know, by this time, usually in Major League Baseball, and it's kind of different this year with the whole corona, but usually by Labor Day, we know, okay, we know. Especially we Ranger fans know that we are not going to the playoffs. That's what we know. But we play out the season. We play out the season, and even though we know we can't win the World Series, we can't even go to the playoffs, we're going to play every single game. So our role then, especially if we get to play those New York Yankees, is to beat them and maybe keep them from going to the playoffs. Yeah. Yankee fans, yeah. We're spoilers. Let me help you with something. Satan wants to spoil your life. He cannot have your soul. He, you have been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Satan cannot have you. But let me tell you what he can do. He can ruin your witness. He can ruin your life. He can... He can deceive you and distract you with trivial things. And while you may be saved, if he can draw you away from the church and keep you at the lake or keep you at the beach or keep you distracted by work, if he can do all that, maybe he can get your, get your kids or your grandkids. See, he's a spoiler. He can't have you. But he wants to wreck as much of your life as he can. And that's why we need to surrender continually to the lordship of Jesus. Because he is also supreme over the church. Look at verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church. I am not the head of the church. Jesus has given me a role to play here, but I am not the head of the church. The head of the church is not in a great big church in Rome. The head of the church is not in Salt Lake City. There is only one being that is qualified to be head of the church, and his name is Jesus. Now in verse 18, he also says this, that he is the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. Now that one makes sense to you. He's the first one that comes forth from the grave. He's supreme over death. He has conquered death. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians when he thinks about Jesus' victory over death. He says, oh death, where is your sting? Jesus took the sting of death. When I was very young, I spent a lot of time with my aunt and uncle and and uh, my cousin, she's the closest thing to a sister I ever had. But Patty had a terrible allergic reaction to bee stings. And I mean, she would like, you know, swell up, get real puffy and that kind of stuff. And so they'd have to give her this medicine. And um, I remember one day we were out, they had horses. We were out washing this particular horse. Uh, we are going to a horse show and we're washing this horse. And this, this bee starts buzzing around. And Patty just goes a little nuts. Because she's scared to death. She knows what happens to her. I mean, it's justifiable. She's got this terrible allergic reaction uh, to bee stings. 
And so she's going nuts. And about that time on my arm, I felt pop. You know, that, that, we've all been stung by something before, that, that, that pop on my arm. And I went, ugh. But then I grabbed it. I said, Patty, Patty, calm down. The bee's still kind of buzzing around. I said, he can't hurt you because there's his stinger in my arm. Now, that's not heroic. It's just kind of what happened, right? But Jesus was heroic because while death is still around, yes, it is, Jesus has taken the sting of death. He's taken the power of death. He's taken the punch of death. And for those of us who trust him, death is just the doorway to eternity. Because Jesus is supreme over death. Finally, Jesus is all sufficient. Look at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure... For all the fullness to dwell in him. Uh, That word, fullness, we're going to see that a lot in this book. Uh, Paul uses it eight times in four short chapters. So it's kind of the word that we're going to focus in on a couple of times. The word fullness that he uses there is the Greek word pleroma. It means the sum total of all divine attributes. It means everything that you need, Jesus is. Let me tell you why I think Paul used it here. The problem that was going to happen at Colossae was what Paul had seen happen and heard it happen at other churches. Paul would go in and plant a church, preach the gospel, tell people who Jesus is. He's teaching them correct doctrine. And then Paul would go plant another church. Paul would move on. Well, these false teachers would then drift in after Paul had left. And they would say, now Paul told you part of what you need. But but you need to add a few things to it. You know, You need the rule book. You need some rules. I mean, you can't just live by grace. You got to know about what kind of haircuts you can have, what kind of clothes you can wear, places you can go, what kind of foods you can eat, what you can drink. You got to have the rule book. Let's add that. And some other teachers would come in and say, "Well, well, what you're lacking actually is You need to worship the angels. You need to add a little angel worship in. That was actually happening. People were not just worshiping Jesus, but worshiping angels. Just add a little angel worship in. Some people would say, you know what? We have a spiritual wisdom. We have this spiritual gift that God's given us. That's a little better. You guys got the standard equipment and we got the luxury model and and we've got the we've got this spiritual wisdom and you need to seek that. You need to add that to your faith. You need to add, you need to add, you need something more than Jesus. And Paul is confronting that error head on, and he says that he is the fullness of God. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. What's Paul saying? Simply this. Jesus is enough. You don't need anything but Jesus. Jesus is enough. You don't have to add all this other stuff to Jesus. Jesus is all sufficient. He is complete. And if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? When you receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. That you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Jesus is enough. You know there are times that if you add to something, you actually take away from it. If you add to Jesus, you actually take away from Jesus. There are things in the world that are just complete. They're done. You don't have to add anything else to them. My wife and my daughter and I went to Paris on one occasion. And we, if you're there, I mean, why not go to the Louvre? I'm not a big art lover. I mean, I can walk through an art museum and look at something. Oh, that's nice. Okay, that's nice. Nice, nice painting. You know, okay, let's move along. See something else. Um, But I I go to art museums sometimes with my wife and daughter. And there are people that just go to art museums. They just stand there. They just look at this picture. I'm like, okay, are you done yet? I mean, move along, people. Come on. Well, if you, some of you have done this. I know some of you talked about it uh, with me. Um, if If you ever get to go to Paris, you go to the Louvre. You go into this room where the Mona Lisa 
is hanging. The Mona Lisa is not a big painting. Mona Lisa is about like that. And so on this wall, you can't get but about 20 feet from it. And there are all these people. I mean, they're just shoved in there, just trying to get a one look. And so I kind of work my way to the front. There it is, Mona Lisa, good, let's go. Um, go see something else. But these people just stand there gazing at it. Now look, the Mona Lisa is a complete work of art. It doesn't need any touch-up. It doesn't need anything added to it. I mean, paint a mustache on the Mona Lisa and you don't add to it, right? You ruin it. Add anything to Jesus. And you haven't really added anything. You've taken away. Jesus is all sufficient and he's all you need. And then Paul concludes this this unit of thought by saying this. And through him, verse 20, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. It always comes back to the cross. Always. It always comes back to the fact that Jesus went to a cross, died a death he didn't deserve to pay a bill that he didn't run up so that you could be forgiven and set free. It always comes back to the simplicity of the cross. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for revealing to us truth in your word. And regardless of what our culture says or what others believe, your word is true. And we embrace the fact that Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of our lives. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of the affection of our hearts. And so this morning, we surrender afresh to him. I pray for those this morning who need to trust Christ. If they've never done that before, if they've never truly trusted in Jesus, the Jesus the Bible describes, not some fairy tale Jesus, that this would be their day. In Jesus' name, amen.